Russian, Dave, Aaron, Kiran. Morning, Pastor. Good morning. Morning, Thomas. Morning, Kiran. Morning, Pastor. Morning. All right. So let's get um, started. Let's take a moment to pray together and uh, we'll get started. I think the others will join us. Um, Siddharth and others. Um, Kanan, Prince. Okay, good. Let's uh, take a moment to pray. And then we will start. Um, Aaron? Oh, are you yes, able to pray? Okay. Yeah, sure, sure, Pastor. Yeah, let me pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day, Lord. And thank you even as we learn your word today. Uh, Lord, reveal us the mighty things you have for us, Lord, even today from your word. So, Lord, Father, uh, I pray and ask for your wisdom so that, Lord, Father, we will understand effectively and apply this in our daily life. So, Lord, uh, we will come you and submit this of the session into your loving hand. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we um, covered Romans chapter 9 last week um, till the end of uh, Romans 9. And I know kind of the the latter part, we uh, went through it a little, little quickly, the last section. Um, so I just wanted to see if um, anybody had any questions. Uh, any things that you would like to clear up from uh, or just revisit from Romans chapter 9? Uh, just to quickly review uh, what, just to quickly review, and then if there are any questions from Romans 9, we can discuss it and then move forward into Roman, um, Romans 10 and 11. Hopefully, we'll cover both uh, 10 and 11 today. Um, the, uh, in Romans 9, Paul uh, turns his attention towards, you know, what is God doing with the Jewish people? Uh, he, you know, he recognizes his own or he expresses his own heart towards the Jewish people. Romans chapter 9, the first few verses, he recognizes what a privileged people they are, the Jewish people, that God has given them the covenants and all of that. But then, uh, you know, what about all the promises he made to them that the other chosen people and through them, the nations of the world would be blessed? And, you know, what about the promises God has made to the Jewish people if God is at the moment working through the church and doing all these wonderful things through the body of Christ? What about them, the Jewish people? So he says, look, um, the promises of God have not failed uh, and will not fail. That's that's what he does. He, he mentions, and then he first of all states that uh, God's promise to them continues to be fulfilled through the children of promise. In fact, that was actually what God was speaking to them, that when he said, you know, I will give you um, descendants, he was actually talking about the children of promise, that is those who, Jews and Gentiles who come to faith. So that's the first thing he points out. The second thing he points out, he tries to, he brings our attention to is that the purposes of God will be fulfilled because God is sovereign and um, he speaks ahead of time and it will happen. Uh, and so the, so we went about interpreting chapter nine, Romans nine, the rest of Romans nine, that is, was uh, 10, uh, 10 onwards to, towards the end of the chapter. Uh, and we we said, look, it has to be interpreted, keeping in mind the sovereignty of God as well as the free will of man. Right? So we intentionally put that together. We didn't isolate the free will of man um, and, and leave it aside, disregard it. No, it has to be taken into account in the way we interpret scripture because the rest of scripture uh, clearly bears evidence to the free will of man, the choice of man that God respects the choice, whether it's Adam or David or Solomon or anybody else that we see in the Bible, they made their own choices, they made their own decisions and they faced the consequences of it. And so while 
while it is true that God's purpose is God is sovereign and his purposes will be fulfilled. And somehow in a very interesting and a very mysterious way, while the man is allowed to have his free will, God is still fulfilling his sovereign purpose through those decisions and choices. And the example he gave us, uh, Paul mentions to us is about Jacob and Esau, about Pharaoh, about the potter and the clay, and then about uh, the uh, the promises that God had given through the prophets Hosea and Isaiah, uh, the, about what he would do for the Gentiles. So for Gentiles and Israel. So he he takes us through this journey, actually, through the Old Testament references, and he brings about this point. And then finally, uh, you know, he closes off, and this is kind of what maybe kind of rushed through verses 32, 33, saying that, you know, what is what what is what is what has been the challenge? The challenge has been that Israel, that is the Jewish people, they are continuing continuing or being insistent on attaining righteousness through the law. They're not willing to let go of that. They want to establish their own righteousness. And, uh, and, and, uh, and they, instead of receiving it by faith, they want to pursue it by the works of the law. And now God is not going to override that. That's their choice. That's what they're doing. So that's kind of how he ends Romans chapter 9. So um, are there any questions in Romans 9 before we start reading chapter 10? Any questions on uh, what we covered? Uh, I, I did mention that it is a challenging chapter because there has been uh, different points of view presented out of this chapter, but we were very careful intentionally to blend both the sovereignty of God and the will of man and look at it from that perspective. Any questions? All right. Hi, Pastor. So, Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. so sorry. it's not really a question, but, uh, you know, when you explain, we understand the concept, like I understand, uh, you know, what the text is saying. But uh, I think my question is a little bit more practical in terms of, uh, so I, I find it difficult to uh, express in words what I understand in my head. You know? mm. So I don't know, I think I might have to just through my vocabulary or uh, I don't know if it's just that or something else. So how, uh, how do you, how did you approach or how did you learn? Yeah. Uh, sorry, um, uh, you, you, you express uh, this, like this, this, this whole truth about God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Is that? I, yes, like, Pastor. Yes. Like what I understand in my head, uh, you know, Sometimes mm. I find it a little challenging to express mm. in words uh, mm. what I you know, understand. Yeah, I think maybe, uh, yeah, and, uh, understand. I think one is um, uh, to think through this, or, or, you know, like, I mean, what I do a, lo a lot is like when I'm studying, I'm actually meditating, thinking through on, on you know, as I'm studying scripture. So I'm pondering, thinking through my own mind, you know, what is hap what is being said. And, and as I look up the meaning or the Greek, or I might read a diff few different versions, uh, I'm mentally thinking through and maybe uh, mentally also like painting pictures to try and understand what the scriptures are saying. So in some way, there's uh, an, an understanding that is evolving within me in my own thinking, my own thought process uh, about you know what the scripture is conveying the second thing of course which is very important for all of us is to use illustrations and uh, i mean I, I know i did not use any illustrations when explaining romans 9 but you know a, a, a simple uh, a common illustration that uh, i would use would be that of the the landlord and the tenant you know so let's say um, i sign a lease with the landlord to rent his apartment, you know. So, so I, I move in. Now, uh, the apartment belongs to the landlord, but I've signed a lease. But now I become responsible for what happens inside the apartment. I can no longer blame the landlord. 
he is the owner. But what happens inside the apartment is 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 what I is is what I'm responsible for. So if I don't keep it clean, if I um, you know if I uh, <laughs> keep it messy, don't do the dishes, don't do the laundry, I can't blame the landlord. I can't say what kind of a landlord this is. This apartment is so dirty. No, who's living there? Who signed? The, who's there now? It's me. I am responsible for what happens here now. At any point, uh, I mean, generally, if the landlord wishes to come into the apartment for whatever reason, now let, let, let's 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 uh, put it like this, right? Generally, the landlord will not just randomly walk into the apartment, even though it is his. He will walk in by invitation. That means the person who's taken the lease, if, if I want to invite the landlord for la la lunch, uh, then I say, hey, like, you know, would you like to come over for lunch or spend some time here? You know, he comes in by invitation, even though the apartment is his because he's given it to me on lease. He's not just going to walk in any time. He's the owner, but he won't walk in. Why? Because he's given it to me on lease and he, he somehow respects that. It is his place. He owns every piece, every brick in the building uh, in this apart in this apartment. He's paid for it, but he just won't walk in through the front door unless he's invited. There are only certain situations where he's legally allowed to walk in. Maybe, you know, there's some sort of a criminal investigation or a police investigation. Then, of course, the landlord and the police will just they have the right to walk into the apartment uninvited. But other than that, he even though the apartment belongs to him, he won't walk in. Now, if I find a problem in the apartment, maybe there's you know uh, there's a plumbing that's broken and leaking or something, then I invite, I talk to the landlord, say, landlord, you know, here's the problem. This is not working. Or so can you come and fix it? And he will, you know, he'll send the right people to fix it. But that's happening based on invitation. So that's, I think, to a fair degree, a good illustration of God and us, how we engage on what happens here on earth. So God is the owner. He owns everything. But he's put us in charge of the earth in some sense. If you want to use the language, you can say he's given us a lease on the earth. He is going to come and take over, you know, uh, the end of the book of Revelation, he's going to come in and he's going to establish new heavens, new earth. You know, it's like, okay, lease is over, guys. <laughs> I'm coming back, you know. Uh, uh, but till that time, this parallel, this analogy, I think, uh, it explains to us how God works with us. He would come in by invitation. He's not going to just override what happens here, you know, our choices. And yet... He, uh, unlike the landlord and the tenant, God is actually working out a certain purpose for humankind, which is which which we don't find in this analogy. So this analogy is, is this illustration is somewhat limited in that sense. It illustrates certain things of the dynamic of relationship, but it, it does not bring out the carrying out a purpose. So somehow that the, the landlord is actually carrying out his purpose in. And the landlord is God. God is carrying out his purpose on the earth in spite of what the choices, you know, the tenant makes. You know, God is still for, you know, even though the tenant may keep the apartment messy and all of that, God is still carrying out his overall purpose. So, you know, if we kind of think maybe in, in terms of some sort of an illustration like that, um, it kind of helps us and to understand as well as to communicate uh, this whole aspect of God being sovereign and, uh, you know, what man is doing. So thank you, Pastor. Okay. So any other questions? Anybody has anything? Else? Okay. So let's go to chapter 10 and chapter, uh, and then of course we come to chapter 11. So like we said, Romans 9, 10, 11, are these three chapters where Paul is explaining one theme, which is uh, what is God doing with the church and with Israel at this time? Right now, it's been broken into three chapters, but actually, it's you know 
it's one part of the essay, uh, part of this letter where Paul is focusing on this. And uh, as you can see in Paul's writing that, you know, he's, he quotes a lot from the Old Testament. In chapter 9 itself, he's, he's referenced the Old Testament uh, several times in trying to explain to us uh, what God is doing, uh, right? So let's get into chapter 10. He's going to continue uh, here in chapter 10, quoting a lot from the Old Testament and, and then applying it to the church, applying it to what God is doing at this time. Let's continue. Let's read uh, Romans chapter 10, and uh, we will read verse one, um, 1 to 5. Romans 10, verses 1 to 5, please. Anybody could read it for us. Time to then, Pastor. All right, please. For, for Moses wrote about the righteousness. Uh, 1 to 5, sorry. Romans 10, 1 to 5. 1 to 5. Sorry. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. Hmm. So, Romans 10. Once again, just like how chapter 9 began, and remember Paul didn't necessarily, Paul didn't write it in chapter and verse that was done much later in the 1800s, uh, but uh, what Paul here, in, 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 in the, he, he has said a lot of things, and then he goes back to what he said at the beginning of chapter 9, which is, brethren, my, he's expressing his heart, you know, it's just, you know, what I really want in my heart is for the Jewish people to be saved. That means for them to come to know Jesus Christ. Now, remember, Paul himself was once a Jew, a staunch Jew. And he's come to faith in Christ. A very powerful encounter. And so for him to say, I want Israel to be saved. That's verse 1. My heart's desire and prayer to God is for Israel to be saved, for that nation, people, Jewish people to be saved. You know, it's it's a big thing. You know, that means he's his. It it is talking about the the significance of his transformation, his conversion. He's come to Christ, and now this once staunch Jew is desiring the same thing for the rest of the Jewish people. And then he recognizes, or he states the problem. He says, you know, uh, verse two. They have a zeal for God. They are people who are very zealous for God. They are very deeply spiritual people. But the problem is they don't have the right knowledge. They don't have the knowledge. They don't know the truth. They, they're still blinded to the truth. Uh, the eyes have not been opened to this. Right? And uh, so what are they doing? Verse 3, because they're ignorant. They're ignorant of how one can receive God's righteousness. They're going about trying to establish their own righteousness. That is which he has mentioned earlier, through the law. So that's the problem. Uh, they, they haven't received a revelation, an understanding of how you can receive God's righteousness through Jesus Christ. But instead, they are trying to establish their own righteousness by keeping the law. And uh, verse 4, he says, you know, but Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. So here's the truth that the Apostle Paul um, is so convinced about, and he bears it, brings it about in his writings. We see it in Romans. We see it especially in Galatians, that Christ 
is the end of the law. That means all of the law was given for one reason, to bring us to Christ. And all of the law is speaking and pointing to one person, Christ. And all of the law is fulfilled and uh, met, satisfied in one person, that's Christ. So Christ is the end of the law. So the law points to him, the law is fulfilled in him, and the law is satisfied by him. Fully satisfied by him. Christ is the end of the law. And it is through him that righteousness is possible for everyone. And he says, unlike verse 5, unlike what Moses said, that if you want righteousness by the law, you've got to live by the law. And that's very difficult, you know, because you're going to end up breaking well, at least one of the many laws. And if you break one law, you broke the whole law. So that option is actually not available. The option of getting righteousness through the law. So the, the only thing that we can do is receive God's righteousness through Christ. But the Jews are unwilling, or Israel is unwilling to see that. They don't, they're not willing to receive that knowledge. And so they're just going about to establish their own righteousness. So that's the problem. And then very interestingly, he continues now uh, in verse 6 to talk about the righteousness that comes from faith. That means How does those, or how actually it's people, right? The people who receive righteousness by faith. How do they live? How do they live? And we see here in, we will read verses 6 through 13. So Romans chapter 10. Let's read, please, verses 6 through 13. Somebody could read that for us, please. Romans 5, 6 to 13. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For, for with the heart one believers into righteousness and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. For the scripture says, whoever, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame for the for there is no distinctions between Jews and Greek for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Man, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So verse six, Romans ten, verse six. Paul is saying but the righteousness that is of faith speaks in this way. So it just says, you know, there's the righteousness of the law, which none of us can receive. But those of us who do receive the righteousness of faith, the righteousness which comes through faith in Christ, we speak like this. We speak like this. And it's very interesting. Why, at this point, is he going into talking about you know, something that has to do with speaking? It says the righteousness, which is of faith, 
speaks in this way? And why is he transitioning into something like this at this point? And secondly, it's very interesting that from here in verse 6, from this point, after he says, the righteousness of faith speaks like this, from that point uh, and uh, till end of verse, uh, to the middle of verse 8, he actually goes and quotes, quoting Moses from Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 11 to 14. So keep your hand in Romans 10. Let's just jump over to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Uh, and just read that verses 11 to 14. So, so here Paul is saying, those who receive righteousness by faith, they speak like this. And then he goes back and he quotes from Moses. Let's read that, Deuteronomy 30, verses 11 to 14, please. Somebody could read that. Deuteronomy 30, 11 to 14. Mm -hmm. Now, what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven, so that you have to ask, who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to, you, to us so we may obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea, so that you have to ask, who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and is in your heart, so you may obey it. Mm, thank you. So Deuteronomy 30, 11 to 14, Moses spoke to the people of Israel. He said, this commandment, that's verse 11, Deuteronomy 30, 11. This commandment, this law, all the words of the book of this law, everything that I've spoken to you, this commandment, it's not too mysterious, it's not too difficult to understand, and neither is it far away from you. But this word, verse 12, it's, I mean, verse 12, it's, it's not so up in heaven that you, you know, you can't get, get, it, get access to it and say, oh, who's going to go up there and bring it to me? It's verse 13, it's not way out there in the sea, the far distant oceans that who's going to cross the seas and get it for me? No, verse 14, the word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. So Moses says, this commandment is very close to you. It's in your heart, it's in your mouth for you to do it. Now, Paul, Romans, going back to Romans 10, verse 6, says, the righteousness of faith speaks like this. And then he quotes, like we said, he quotes from Deuteronomy 30, 11 to 14. But instead of saying the commandment, he says, the word of faith, which we preach. So he says, the word is near you. Moses said, the commandment is near you. Paul is using that same text, but he's replacing commandment with something else. He's saying in Romans 10, verse 6, you know, he says, do not say, who will ascend into heaven to bring Christ? So he's really replacing, or let me put it like this, he's really replacing commandment with Christ, because he has just stated the end of the law is Christ. The end of the commandment is Christ. So he's replacing that commandment or lo the law with Christ, with the word or the message of Christ, the word of faith. So he says, verse 6, don't say into your heart, who's going to bring Christ down from above? Or don't say, you know, who's going to descend into the abyss or go down to the depths of the sea to bring Christ out from the dead as he's dead. He's still dead. But, verse 8, Romans 10, 8, what does it say? Scripture, what does all scripture say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. And now Paul explains what I'm referring to, Romans 10, verse 8, is he's saying, that is the word of faith 
which we preach. So, what is he trying to do here? Several things. One, really the way that God wants us to live has not changed. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 13, 11 to 14, he said, you've got to keep my word in your heart and in your mouth in order to do it. Come into the New Testament, keep my word in your heart and in your mouth. But what has changed is the word that we keep. In the old, it was the commandment or the law. In the new, it's the message of Christ, the word of faith, which we preach. Keep that word, the word of Christ, the word of faith, the, the teaching of Jesus and who Jesus is and what he has done and what he has made available. So, so the, the commandment has been replaced with Christ. The law has been replaced with Christ. And keep his word his message in your heart and in your mouth. But whether in the old or the new, we live the same way. His word is in our heart and in our mouth. So what Paul is saying is, look, we're living the same way, but Christ has replaced the commandment. Moses said, this commandment which I command you, will be in your heart and in your mouth so that you can do it. Paul comes around and says, the end of the commandment, the end of the law is Christ. And Christ isn't so far away or deep down, but he's right near you. And what is that? It's the word of faith. It's the message of Christ, who Christ is and what he has done. And that message, that word, keep it in your heart, keep it in your mouth. And then he explains to us in verses 9 and 10, something that is not explained to us in Deuteronomy 30, as to how this whole thing works, like the dynamics of it, the, like the inner details of the working of keeping that word in our heart and in our mouth. Or when I say word, it's the message of Christ or the word of faith which we preach, which Paul mentions here in Romans 10 verse 8. This word of faith, this message that produces faith. And what is the message? It's about Christ. So how does that work? What, what is the dynamics of this whole thing? He's explaining to us in verse 9 and 10, which is not explained to us in Romans, in Deuteronomy 30. In Deuteronomy 30, God simply told them, hey, keep my word in your heart, in your mouth, and so that you may do it. But Paul is taking a little further, and he's saying, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth, who? The Lord Jesus. So that's, so Christ has replaced the commandment. So you confess with your mouth, not the commandment, but you confess Christ, the Lord Jesus. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Oh, so he's saying, you know that principle there in the Old Testament that God gave to his people? We are living by the same principle here in the New Testament. Just that Christ has replaced commandment. And if we believe in this Jesus, who he is, his message, and we confess that with our, him with our mouth, who he is and what he has done and his message, we will experience salvation. Verse 10, for with a heart one believes unto righteousness. So why does God want us to keep his word in our heart? Because we believe with our heart. That means you believe that word. You believe who Christ is, what he has done, his message. You believe with your heart. And when you believe in your heart, it puts you in a place of righteousness. It puts you in a place of right standing with God. You are in a position where you are 
You're rightly positioned before God. You're in a right standing with God. You're in a place of righteousness. So with heart, man believes, resulting in righteousness. That's verse 10. And with the mouth, confession is made. Resulting in or unto salvation or resulting in salvation. That means the experience of who Christ is or what he has done and what his message says, the, the message of Christ. You experience that salvation takes place in our lives. So, those of us who receive righteousness by faith, we speak like this. So, uh, you know, we can. there's a lot that we can emphasize from these verses. We can emphasize the way we are supposed to speak those of us who receive righteousness by faith. This is how we are supposed to speak. That is, we, speak, we believe in our heart and we speak with our mouth who Jesus is, what he has done, what he has provided for us. That is the message of Christ, the word of faith which we preach, as Paul is saying. That means everything that Paul is saying, everything we have been preaching to you about, about Christ, you know, that is what we have to speak. And we do not speak as though Christ is so far away in heaven or as though he's still dead beneath. So he says, don't speak like that. You are a person who has received righteousness by faith. So you don't say, oh, who is going to bring Christ from heaven or who is going to bring him down from the up from the dead. No, don't speak like that. But instead, his message, the word of faith, is right there with you. It's in your heart and it's in your mouth. In your heart, you believe that message about Christ and it puts you in a right standing with God. And you say it with your mouth and experience salvation. That means who Christ is, the Savior, the Deliverer. Now, the other thing we can say is, or this, the other extension of extrapolating or extending this truth is, it's not just about saying it once. Because if you go back to Deuteronomy 30, God didn't just say, say my law once in your lifetime. That wasn't the intent of what God said in Deuteronomy 30. He said, it's, 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 some, it's a way of life. This commandment will be in your heart and in your mouth that you may do it. That means you may live by it. It's a way of life. Keeping his word in our heart and in our mouth is our way of life. So confessing, believing and confessing who Christ is to us, is our way of life. It's not that I do it once. You know, so usually we, we use these scriptures. If you've never been saved, I want you to say this with me. Okay, you're saved. God bless you. <laughs> Wonderful. And we leave it at that. But the original intent of what Paul is presenting here, which he quoted from Deuteronomy 30, was not given as a one-off thing. It was given as a lifestyle. So, Romans 10, 8 through 10, is a lifestyle. It's a way of life. That means we continually believe in our heart and confess with our mouth who Jesus Christ is. What he has accomplished for us through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. What that means for us. It's a way of life. This is how those who have received righteousness by faith speak they always speak the word of faith. They always speak the message of who Jesus is, what he has done, how we, uh, through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. They are believing that all the time, and they're saying that. That's how they live. And doing that, that is believing in our heart and confessing with our mouth, puts us in this place of right standing with God and of receiving or experiencing who Christ is. Because he says that the heart man believes unto righteousness, where the mouth confession is made unto 
salvation. So both salvation, righteousness, and experiencing salvation, that is the saving, healing, delivering, work, who Christ is to us, the Savior, experiencing that comes through this way of believing in our heart and confessing with our mouth this message of Christ, who Christ is. So, as a way of life, this is what we do. And this is how we experience Christ as our Savior in every sense. The word salvation, uh, we need to point out, is it's the word sozo, or uh, the, the, the word there simply means uh, that that word salvation in the Greek in, is, a, is a comprehensive word. It includes forgiveness of sins, as, as we understand it, being healed from sickness, being delivered from bondage, being uh, set free, being rescued from harm and danger, being granted experiencing victory over enemies, uh, wholeness, uh, all of that is in that word salvation, because you'll find it some, sometimes that word, you know, uh, where it says, you know, um, your faith has saved you. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has made you whole. So it's that same word that's translated saved, healed, or whole. So experiencing that wholeness that comes through Christ or salvation that comes through Christ it happens like this. You believe in your heart, you say with your mouth. And I just want to point out, you know, the word confession, it means to, the word confess is homologia. That means to say the same thing. That means ours, we speak in agreement with who Christ is. This is who Jesus is. This is what he did for me on the cross through his death, burial, resurrection, ascension. So I am saying the same thing. I'm saying who Christ is. I'm not saying contrary to who he is, but I'm speaking in agreement with who he is and what he has done. That's confession. Or with a heart, man believes unto righteousness and with a mouth confession, that means you're speaking in agreement with. You're saying who Christ is. And this is very important because Jesus did tell us in Matthew 10, you know, verse 32, he said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my father. And if we acknowledge and say who Christ is to us, then Jesus says, look, I will declare the same thing, that I am this to them. I am their savior, healer, deliverer, redeemer, so on. So, Romans 10, 6 through 10 is an interesting passage because the Apostle Paul is taking this Old Testament text and applying it to those of us who believe in Christ. And it starts off, it stems from this truth that Christ is the end of the law. This was a practice God gave for those under the law the same practice is continuing, but the commandment is replaced with the person of Christ. The law is replaced with the person of Christ. And Paul gets into a little bit more details on the dynamic, what happens when we do this of believing in our heart and saying with our mouth the word that God has given to us. And in the light of this, he says, look, verse 11, 12, 13, this word of faith, this message of Christ, what he did through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, has to reach all people. It's not just for us, because anyone can have access to this. Whoever, verse 11, for the scripture says, whoever believes, again, verse 13, whoever calls, meaning this is, for everybody, verse 12, the Jew and the Greek, because God is rich to all who call on him. That means this message and this, this truth about this preaching about Christ or this word of faith concerning Christ 
has to go to all people. And it's, it's, it's accessible to Jew and Greek, anyone. And God will respond to all of them. Okay? Till verse 13. You all with me so far? Yes, sir. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So, um, yeah, I think uh, uh, let's read uh, verses 14 to 21, and then we'll just go for a break. And uh, after that, and then we will uh, explain. The rest, of, the rest of this chapter is more of a motivation to say, look, this message of Christ has to go out to everybody. Right? So let's just read verses 14 to 21, uh, Romans 10, 14 to 21. Somebody could read it for us. And then uh, we'll go for a break and come back. Yeah, Romans uh, verse 14 and 21. How can, sorry, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in one of the whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. Again I ask, did desire not understand? First Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, All day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Mm. Thank you, Sadat. Thank you. All right. So we will uh, take our break. And then we'll come back and look at verses 14 to 21. What is Paul bringing out here in the light of what he has already shared with us? So let's take a break and we'll be back in about 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 